November 1944, south of Honshu, Japan. Through the morning mist, the Imperial Navy's newest pride slices across the water, a floating fortress larger than anything ever built in Asia. Her name is Shinano, a supercarrier born from desperation. 70,000 tons of steel, 16 inches of armor, a crew of 3,000. Japanese engineers called her unsinkable, but beneath the waves, an American submarine waits, invisible, silent, patient. At 3.17 a.m., it fires six torpedoes, four hit. Within two hours, the world's largest aircraft carrier, the culmination of Japan's naval engineering, is gone. The Imperial Navy never understood how it happened so fast. They didn't know that America had created a weapon system so advanced, so invisible, that no armor or speed could save them. What the Japanese believed was an accident was in fact the result of one of the greatest engineering revolutions of the Second World War. But to understand how this was possible, we need to go back to the moment Japan bet everything on its supercarriers, and America rewrote the science of underwater warfare. In 1942, the Pacific Ocean became the world's largest laboratory for naval innovation. Japan ruled the waves with carriers like Akagi, Kaga, and Zuikaku, masterpieces of naval engineering that struck Pearl Harbor and shattered Western confidence overnight. At that moment, Japan's carrier doctrine was decades ahead of everyone else's. Their engineers had pioneered hydraulic aircraft elevators, advanced arrestor gear, and coordinated deck operations that allowed over a hundred planes to launch in. Under ten minutes, the Imperial Navy believed their ships could never be caught unprepared again. But, American engineers were learning, and fast. The loss of carriers Lexington and Yorktown forced U.S. naval design bureaus to reimagine the fundamentals of warfare. Not just how to build ships, but how to detect, hunt, and destroy them invisibly. By 1943, the U.S. Navy's Bureau of Ordnance had transformed its weapon testing facilities into high-security innovation zones. Submarines received new sonar arrays, self-compensating torpedoes, and magnetic exploders designed to detonate beneath a hull rather than against it. This single shift from surface detonation to underkeel explosion turned the laws of naval physics into America's deadliest ally. When the blast occurs below the hull, the pressure wave lifts the ship, then drops it into a vacuum, breaking its spine. Armor doesn't matter. Size doesn't matter. The ocean itself becomes the weapon. And in that equation, even Japan's greatest engineering masterpiece on its supercarrier program was doomed from the start. What happened next would shock the engineering world. The Imperial Japanese Navy faced a paradox. Its early victories had depended on light, fast carriers. But after midway in 1942, when four of those carriers were destroyed in a single day, Japan's naval engineers were ordered to build something indestructible, a warship that could survive anything America could throw at it. At Kure Naval Arsenal, draftsmen unrolled the plans for the Yamato-class hull, originally meant for a battleship, and reimagined it as a carrier. The conversion became the Shinano. It was to be the fortress of the seas, armored flight decks, redundant watertight compartments, anti-torpedo bulges, and fuel storage buried deep in the hull. Every technical decision reflected one obsession, survival. But survival against what? That was the blind spot. Japan's engineers built against their last defeat. They assumed America would use dive bombers, torpedoes, and carrier-based strikes, the same weapons that had destroyed Akagi and Kaga. What they didn't anticipate was that the next revolution was happening underwater, in a world they could not see. Meanwhile, on the other side of the Pacific, American engineers faced their own crisis. The Mark 14 torpedo, the Navy's standard weapon since 1931 was failing catastrophically. Early war reports showed 60% failure rates, duds, premature detonations, or torpedoes that simply ran too deep. For submarine crews risking everything, it was a nightmare. One captain wrote in his log, We are firing firecrackers against steel. The U.S. Navy turned to the engineers of the Naval Torpedo Station at Newport, Rhode Island. Under relentless pressure from Admiral Charles Lockwood and the Pacific Fleet, they dissected every failure, built underwater test tanks, and began applying advanced hydrodynamic modeling long before computers existed. By 1943, 
They had produced the Mark 18 electric torpedo, a weapon unlike anything Japan had imagined. It left no visible trail, no compressed air wake, no warning, and it carried a magnetic exploder calibrated to detonate directly beneath a target's center of mass. The ocean would do the rest. But even with this weapon perfected, there was one final challenge, finding the enemy. Japan's engineers prided themselves on stealth and silence. Their ships could outrun and outgun any American submarine. But what they could not escape was a new kind of detection system, born not in the engine rooms, but in the laboratories of American universities. This was the secret, weapon the Japanese never saw coming. The breakthrough came from a small laboratory at Harvard in 1941, the Underwater Sound Laboratory, part of the classified Harvard-MIT radiation laboratory network. While radar detected planes in the sky, these scientists were perfecting sonar to track ships beneath the waves. They called it Project Diablo, short for Detection Indicator Acoustic Beacon Locator. By 1944, its combat version, known as the QHB sonar, was installed on every major American submarine. The system could scan the ocean floor, detect moving steel at distances up to 8,000 yards, and provide precise bearing data for firing solutions. Combined with the new torpedo data computer, a mechanical analog computer, it allowed American submarines to perform something previously impossible, a blind, perfect shot, show diagram of sonar signal bouncing off hull, animation of firing solution calculation. The Japanese believed submarines hunted by guesswork and luck. They didn't know the Americans had turned it into a science. By late 1944, the Imperial Navy was collapsing under logistical strain. The Taiho, Japan's first armored carrier, had exploded months earlier when gasoline vapors ignited after a torpedo hit. The Zuikaku, one of the last Pearl Harbor veterans, had been sunk at Lady Gulf. In response, Japan rushed Shinano into service before her systems were complete. She carried only 47 planes, less than a third of her design capacity, but she was enormous, armored, and they believed unsinkable. On November 28, 1944, she set sail from Yokosuka under escort. Her captain, Toshio Abe, trusted her size to protect her. Her watertight compartments, armor belts, and advanced pumps were supposed to make her invincible. But below the surface, the USS Archerfish and commanded by Commander Joseph Enright had been tracking her for hours using QHB sonar. At 3.17 a.m., six torpedoes left the tubes. Four found their mark. One struck near the forward aviation fuel tanks. Another tore open the portside anti-torpedo bulge. Within minutes, flooding overwhelmed the internal pumps. Shinano's engineers tried to seal the compartments, but poor welding, untested valves, and incomplete fittings failed. By 10 a.m., Japan's largest warship was gone, 72,000 tons of steel sinking beneath the Pacific. In a single engagement, American engineering had erased what Japanese admirals once called the ship that would never die. But Shinano was only the symbol. Behind her destruction lay something far greater, a scientific revolution that Japan's industry could no longer match. By early 1945, American submarines had turned the Pacific into a graveyard of Japanese shipping. With sonar and the Mark 18 torpedo, they were sinking enemy ships faster than Japan could build them. Map Pacific Shipping Routes, 1942 vs. 1945, Red Lines Fading. In 1942, Japan had over 6 million tons of merchant shipping. By August 1945, less than 1.5 million remained afloat. 90% of Japan's oil, food, and ammunition routes were cut. What? The Japanese high command had believed to be an invisible ocean empire, safe behind island fortresses and carrier. Fleets had been strangled by mathematics and engineering. Dian battle reports recovered after the war. Japanese admirals repeatedly asked how American submarines were locating their convoys so precisely. They blamed spies, intercepted communications, even luck. Few understood that the real answer was sonar. Sound turned into sight. Every ping that echoed through the Pacific carried the weight of a million calculations. Speed, bearing depth, salinity, temperature, all computed by analog gears spinning inside the torpedo data. Computer, show close-up of mechanical. Computer gears turning. It was mechanical artistry on the edge of science, a weapon guided not by instinct, but by pure engineering, and it worked relentlessly. 
By the time Japan's naval engineers began studying countermeasures, rubber coatings, decoy devices, and depth-controlled routing, the war was already over. The carriers Amagi and Katsuragi, never fully operational, were destroyed by air raids in Kiri Harbor. The dream of the supercarrier, once the pinnacle of Japanese naval power, ended without ever launching a full complement of aircraft. For the Imperial Navy, it was not just a defeat of arms. It was a defeat of imagination. In the final months of the war, Japanese engineers desperately studied the wreckage of their lost carriers. They noted how few torpedoes it took to cripple massive ships, how the damage came not from the sides, but from beneath, pressure fractures invisible to the naked eye. They tried to develop magnetic detonators of their own, but Japan's electronics industry lacked the precision to match America's compact gyroscopic sensors and vacuum tube amplifiers. The few experimental models tested in 1945 failed under combat conditions. Meanwhile, the United States continued refining sonar and torpedo technology into a post-war doctrine of dominance. The lessons of the Pacific would form the foundation for Cold War naval design, from the nuclear submarine to the guided torpedo that could home in on sound. The principles remained the same. Detect, compute, destroy before the enemy ever knows you're there. Today, naval historians still regard the destruction of Japan's supercarriers as the moment when modern naval warfare crossed a threshold and from visible battles to invisible mathematics. Japan's dream of the unsinkable ship was shattered not by force but by computation, and that shift from armor to algorithm would define the next hundred years of warfare. The legacy of those engineering breakthroughs is still alive today. Modern torpedoes like the uh, US MK-48 and British Spearfish use digital sonar homing. Descendants of the QHB system tested in 1944 submarine. Combat has become a contest of silence and signal, of algorithms and echoes. Even aircraft carriers, once the kings of the ocean, are built with the lessons of Shinano in mind. No matter how large or advanced, every warship today is designed under one principle born in the Pacific. There is no such thing as unsinkable. Show, modern U.S. Navy carrier at sea, sonar animation fades underneath. What began as a desperate race between two nations became a permanent lesson in humility. That engineering perfection is not about invincibility, but adaptability. When the USS Archer Fish's torpedoes struck the Shinano, they didn't just sink a ship. They sank an idea. The belief that size and power alone could defy science, and in its place rose a new era of warfare, where the true battlefield is invisible, and victory belongs to the engineers who can see the unseen. If you enjoyed this deep dive into the engineering that reshaped naval warfare, consider subscribing for more untold stories of technology, innovation, and human ingenuity. Next, watch our documentary on German radar scientists and the 72 hour miracle that changed the Atlantic War. Because in history, as in engineering, the smallest innovation can sink the largest empire.